Okay, so today I want to talk about um, what I guess I would generically call image blending. And like I said, this is something that um, I talked about a lot in my visual effects course. And if you look on YouTube, there's already kind of a video that's similar to this one. This is going to be a little bit more from the level of if all you knew was what we talked about in image processing so far in this class, you know, you should be able to understand this lecture. And so the basic idea is the following. So I've got what I'm going to call a source image. And I'm going to have what I call the target image. And the idea is that I want to take some chunk of the source and I want to kind of paste it into the target, right? So if I call this, you know, S and this T, so kind of like the idea is that, you know, in the composite, so kind of here, what I want to have is this region should roughly come from S, and this region should roughly come from T, okay? And so um, this is kind of related to a lot of problems that we face in things like image mosaicing. So for example, when we talked about the geometric transformations lecture a couple months ago, we took a bunch of images of the same scene that were of different fields of view, and we tried to stitch them together into one thing that looked good, right? Um, and so that's the basic idea, but it turns out that things generally look bad if I were just to cut out this region and paste it right on top of the target, right? You're going to see the seam or the line between S and T. And so kind of the question today is, how do we fudge or how do we disguise the intensities across that seam to make the composite look more imperceptible, right? And so, like I said, one kind of cool um, connection to visual effects is that, you know, this is how they you know, or used to make, uh, go away. Hey, what was that? This is how they used to make, uh, you know, visual effects shots. I have some sort of weird ad here. I don't want to share my thingy. So here's a scene from the last, you know, the last uh, scene of Mary's of the Lost Ark, right? Where the guy's pushing the cart down this long hallway. And actually, you know, much of that hallway was a super detailed, hand drawn map painting on a big piece of glass. And then they, what is with this crappy ad? Maytag repairman, go away. <sighs> Why you suck. All right. So the idea is that there was this highly detailed glass painting, right, done by a professional artist. And then what they did was they shot through this pane of glass into a real environment with a guy pushing a cart down a warehouse. And so here's a, here's a more 3D thing that kind of gives you a sense of how that worked, right? So here, this is a movie that it's supposed to take place in Pompeii, where Pompeii is about to erupt, right? So kind of the lower right-hand corner is the final image as seen through the camera. But here you can see that actually what's happened is there's this very clear pane of glass with the volcano part carefully painted on it, right? So here you're looking at it from a different angle. So you can see the pane of glass hanging in front of the camera. And then here's a little bit more of an angle where you can see that the pane of glass doesn't exactly line up with the real world, but when it does, you kind of get this sense that you've combined these two images together, right? And so what they might have done to kind of fudge the edge would be, you know, to make the painting kind of semi-transparent or semi-fuzzy around the edges. And so it's not just like a hard line where you've got paint and then the real world, but instead you have kind of like translucent or transparent paint that kind of fades off on the edges. And so what we want to talk about today is kind of how does that process work? So here I have a bunch of figures. Here's a better picture of the compositing problem, right? The stripy image is the source. The gray image is the target. And then I have this binary image, which I'm going to call the mask, M. And the idea here is that the mask tells me which pixels from the source do I want in the composite, right? And so if I don't take any, you know, take any effort to mitigate that problem, what you're generally going to see is kind of this hard line around the source and the target, right? So here's kind of an example of here's my source, here's my target, right? So what I, or I'm sorry, here's my target, here's my source. What I want to do is I want to put the cow here on the target. If I do that in black and white and just kind of smack the cow down, you see that there is this kind of halo that's very visible, right? Like you can really tell that there's a 
you know, cardboard cutout or a magazine, you know, I've, I've cut out with scissors and I've stuck the thing on top, right? So this is not a very convincing composite. The question is, what can we do to make that, you know, composite look better? And so, one idea, so kind of the equivalent to what I just showed you was something like this, where we say, I've got a mask image that tells me, you know, it's kind of one here and zero here. Right, so these are the pieces that we have today. We have the source, the target, and the mask. And so one thing that I could do naively, which I said doesn't look very good, is to say that my composite, so I call this like hard compositing, for example. I could say, well, I take the mask pixels that are one, I multiply that by the source, and I add to it one minus the mass pixels, and I multiply that by the target. That's basically the same as saying that you know either I have the source where the mass pixels are equal to one, or I have the target where the mass pixels are equal to zero, right? And this gives me you know generally not a good image, and that's because the seam or the, sometimes you call it the mat line, is generally visible. And so, actually, you know, for a while, this was the best you could do, right? So if, if you look at old movies like, um, like Back to the Future 2 and 3, right, where there's multiple copies of Barney McFly interacting with himself, right? You used to see that there would be like this very strong dividing line between one shot and another shot, right? There would be a countertop or there would be a pole right down the middle of the image, right? That's where they would kind of put these two things up together. And if you are careful, maybe you can disguise that line. But oftentimes, because the film was developed differently, you know, you might see that there's some sort of weird color difference between the left-hand side of the image and the right-hand side of the image. So it used to be a little more obvious, right? We're going to talk today and also next time about ways to make the, the line appear almost invisible. The natural thing to do first try is to say, okay, well, what if we were to fuzz the line a little bit, right? So instead of having this hard binary edge, what if we were to make kind of a transition region so that we might say, um, you know, I could make a weighted transition region. Where now, what I might say is that, um, if I have my my mask that tells me one here and zero here, what I might do is I might kind of build a little band inside and outside this guy. And then I'd say, okay, well, the profile kind of along this band, if I were to blow it up, would look something like this. So on the... Um, let me think about this. So on the target side and on the source side, so basically that's like saying that on one side of this, I want all target and no source. On this side, I want all source and no target. And then, for example, what I could do is I could kind of blend to say, okay, I'm going to you know, right on the border, maybe this is where I have like a halfway point where I'm saying take half the source and half the target. And as I go over here, I have, you know, three quarters of the target and one quarter of the source. So basically what I could do is kind of make a composite where in this region, I get kind of a linear blend between S and T, right? And kind of a different way of thinking about that is instead of the mask itself being, you know, between a binary between zero and one. Instead, the profile of the mask, you know, instead of looking like this from the side, I could make it look like kind of this from the side. Or even kind of, you know, like a smoother thing like this, right? So that's not a bad idea to kind of make the trans, and I have a choice, right, to make about how wide should this region be where it's not entirely binary, right? 
the wider I make it, the more diffuse the edge will be. But on the other hand, I may not get quite what I want there either. And so kind of the problem with this is that in some cases, I may see that, what is the deal here? Like here is an example of say, okay, suppose I were to fuzz up the transition region a little bit, right? So this is kind of like saying the easiest thing to do would be to take the mask region and apply a Gaussian blur, just like Gaussian filter this binary image. What I should get would be something that's mostly, you know, it's black still in the background, it's white still in the foreground, but along the edge I get shades of gray. And when I use that to combine the two images, I would get something like this, right? So maybe the edge is not so obvious anymore, but there's still something that's kind of fuzzy there, right? Or if I were to make an even bigger transition region, you know, now I kind of get this halo, but I can also see there's starting to be some weird visual artifacts kind of, you know, where, where it's half and half, like I'm starting to lose some image detail kind of around the halo, right? So these are, these are not really that satisfying either. So the answer to making a little bit better composite along these lines is called a Laplacian pyramid, okay? And so, let's go back to here. Clearly there's something I don't understand about switching back and forth between these windows. Okay. So a better idea is what's called multi-resolution blending. Multi-blend. Multi-resolution blending. With a Laplacian pyramid. Right, so we talked already about Laplacian, right? Laplacian should mean in your mind detecting edges, right? And that's exactly what we're going to do here. The idea is to say, okay, you know, um, there are going to be low frequency parts to the image and there are going to be high frequency parts, like edges to the image. And I don't want to blend the edges across a wide transition band because those can change spatially very close together. So the idea is that I want to not use a wide band for edges, but in places where the color is varying slowly, then I can use a pretty wide band. Like the idea is I should have wider transition regions for low frequencies and narrower transition regions for high frequencies. So the idea is exactly that. So wide transition regions for, you know, low frequency components. and narrow transition regions for high frequency complex. Right, which we know in the context of images means edges. And so the idea here is we're going to use so I said pyramid, right? So we're going to use what's called the Laplacian pyramid, which is related to something that's called the Gaussian pyramid, okay? And so um, first let me tell you what a Gaussian pyramid is. It's a very simple idea. So um, a Gaussian pyramid simply means that I choose some Gaussian blurring kernel or filter, right? So for example, you know, I could make this be like a five by five Gaussian filter, which looks, you know, like a small, a small hill in two directions. And then what I do is I make a hierarchy of images, okay? So I'm gonna let um, G0 be the original image at full resolution. And then I'm going to let GI be, actually I probably should, to avoid confusion, let me call this K instead of G because I'm already dealing with G here. So let's suppose that I say that GI is what I get if I convolve K with the previous image and I downsample that by a factor of two. Right, so this here is basically convolution, and this is uh, downsample 
by 2 in both dimensions. So all I'm doing here is I'm making a series of smaller, blurrier images, right? So G0 is the full image. I blur that with a Gaussian filter, 5 by 5. Then I make it half as big. Then I blur that image with a Gaussian filter, 5 by 5, and I make that half as big. So what I'm going to get is kind of a series of smaller and blurrier images, OK? And so um, here's kind of an example of what those images look like, right? So here, G0, which I can't even fit on my screen, is a big image, right, with high detail. G1 is a slightly smaller image with lower detail. G2 is smaller still, and then I go all the way down to, you know, I guess G4 is not on, on your screen. I can see it on my screen, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm making a series of, you know, like smaller blurrier images, okay? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the edges that are important at each of these scales, okay? And so what I actually am going to look at next is the differences of Gaussians at each scale. Right? So what I mean there is I'm going to make another set of images where I'm going to take the blurry image at scale i, and I'm going to subtract from it the filtered version of that image. Okay? So here, this is like the Gaussian pyramid image at you know scale i. And this is a blurred version of that image. And so here, what do we know about image processing? Well, I should know that if I take an image and I subtract a low-pass a low-pass filtered version of that image, this should kind of result in edges of the image, right? So this is like a high-pass image at scale i, right? Because I've got original minus low-pass equals high-pass, right? And so these images here form what's called a Laplacian pyramid. So the set of Li form what's called a Laplacian pyramid. And again, notice that these Ls are also different sizes, right? Because each of these Gs is smaller than the previous one, right? So what I kind of get is a set of edge images that are smaller and smaller, right? So if I look at my original guy here, what is my deal today? So here, this is the corresponding Laplacian pyramid, right? So here, the first L0 is like saying, take my original image and subtract a blurry version of it. And what I get are edges of the big image, right? L1 is like saying, OK, take my slightly smaller image, G1, and subtract a blurry version of that there. So now I get edges in G1, edges in G2, edges in G3, and so on. And kind of the way that you can think about this is that as I reduce the size of the image, every time I have a smaller image in the Gaussian pyramid, it's getting blurrier, right? So I'm blurring out edges that are insignificant at the lower scale, right? So for example, this top image has all this detail in the, you know, the graininess of the steps, for example, has all this kind of, you know, high frequency detail. It's really only present in the zoomed out version of the image, right? So when I look at the edges of that, I'm probably going to see, you know, some edges over here in the pavement and so on, right? After I blur that image in the next layer of the Gaussian pyramid, that kind of edge detail is going to go away, and I'm going to get edges in L1 that are kind of more significant than edges in L0, edges that still remain after I've blurred down the image, right? So that by the time I get to like L3, the only edges that I'm going to see in that image are really 
ones that would have stood out strongly in the original image. So kind of one way to think about this Laplacian pyramid is like a multi-scale edge representation of the image, where the edges that are present in the small Laplacian pyramids are like the most significant, the most visually important images, visually important edges in the image. Whereas the stuff that's down L0 is like you know, edges that are really like fine detail edges. So kind of you can think about it as a, as a detailed decomposition of the edges. And the idea is that to get back to my original image, I can think about saying, okay, well, all I need to do is I can take the, um, I can take the blurriest image, right? So here I'm kind of zooming out. So I could take the blurriest image, which I can choose as either G4 or by convention, that's also what we call L4. And I can make this image bigger, add back the edges at that scale, make that image bigger, add, the, add back the edges at this scale. So kind of like I can reconstruct the original image by adding the edges back at different scales, right? So kind of more mathematically, what I mean by that is we can recover the original image. as I take my original image to be the sum of each of these Laplacian images upsampled, you know, to full size. Right? Kind of the idea is add back all the edges at different scales. Plus, you know, and, and kind of the baseline that I start with is the smallest, blurriest image, which is either, you know, what I call, what I would call GN or LN. Okay, so here's the idea. So now I've got ways of representing, you know, kind of one way I think about this is that the L0, right, the one that is like the edges at the, at the biggest resolution, corresponds to the stuff that I would want to have a narrow transition region, right? I want to keep the edges, you know, carefully uh, preserved when I've got these fine detail edges. But the things that are, you know, only so good at, you know, the, the things that are lower frequency, right, I can afford to have wider transitions for. And so the kind of concept here is that I'm going to make masks at each of these scales that is a little bit, you know, where the transition region is small here and wide here. And so kind of I have a picture of that like this. So kind of the idea is that I want to say, okay, at the, man, I'm having problems today with my smooth operation here. So here's the idea is that, you know, this is my target, this is my source, and the white line denotes my mask, okay? So here, what I have is that at the most blurry image, I can afford to make my mask a lot wider band, right? So it's kind of like looking at taking the mask and applying a big blur to it, right? So instead of having just binary images, I've got shades of gray. And so that means that when I combine the two blurriest, you know, the blurriest version of the target and the blurriest version of the source with this big blurry mask, I get kind of a very coarse image of the composite. And then as I move down the pyramid for each of the, each of the source and the target, I use a narrower transition region, and then I add up all these images to get back my composite, right? So let me be a little more mathematical about what I mean by that. So, you know, to do image composition, what I could do is I could say um, compute the Laplacian pyramids for the source and the target. So let's call those, you know, L superscript S and L superscript T. 
And I'm also going to compute a Gaussian pyramid for the mask, M, which I'm going to call uh, G. Okay. And then my idea is that I'm going to make a Laplacian pyramid for the composite, which is kind of like a version of what I started out originally, right? So instead of combining the source and the target with a binary mask, instead what I'm going to say is this is going to be the Laplacian pyramid from the source, this is going to be the Laplacian pyramid from the target, and this is going to be kind of like my Gaussian pyramid for the mask. And so let me be more explicit about that. The Laplacian pyramid for the composite at scale i is going to be the Gaussian pyramid of the mask at scale i times the this. This is probably the easiest way to say it. So it's like saying I'm going to combine these edge images at a given scale with a mask whose effective size varies based on what scale the pyramid I'm at, right? So at the very uh, lowest scale, G0, right, that's just like the original mask. And so there's not going to be any blurring there. But as I work my way down to the lower levels of the pyramid, I'm going to have a very blurry mask. And then basically I add up to get you know, the final composite. And so the result of that is seen at the right. And so here, you know, if I compare this to my previous uh, composites, I can still see that there's something that's a little bit off, but I can't really put my finger on any particular pixel of that image that is bad. Right? Like I can't really spot the transition region anymore, right? Part of the reason that things look a little bit off is that the texture of the grass in the cow region is not exactly the same grass texture as the surrounding region. So there's a little bit of a disconnect where it seems like maybe the grass in here is going, you know, maybe it's a little bit finer, you know, density than the grass here. But I mean, it looks better than it did in the sense that it's hard for me to tell exactly, you know, where the, where the boundary is. If I compare that to like my previous attempt like this, you know, here, I can definitely see where the boundary was, right? I don't really have that in I think I have a final image of the composite here, right? I don't really have that quite so much here. I mean, it's kind of a hard argument to make. I'm going to show you a better method in just a second that will kind of solve some of these problems. But I think the biggest reason that you see a difference is just the difference in texture, right? Like it seems like there's a little bit of different orientation between the grass here and the grass there. But it's hard to put your finger on, you know, particularly bad pixels. So this is one idea. But here's a better idea, OK? So the next idea is really cool. And this is called uh, Poisson image editing. So another idea, what I would even call a better idea, is called Poisson image editing. And so if you took probability, remember we had a Poisson distribution, this is the same guy. Although not the, the, the Poisson guy didn't have anything to do with this actual algorithm. I'll tell you what the connection is in just a second. So the idea here is as follows, right? So I have the same setup where I have a source and a target. And I still have a mask, a region where I want to take source pixels and put them into the target. Here I'm going to describe it slightly differently, where I'm going to specify a region here that I'm going to call omega. Okay, so omega is basically, um, you know, the pixels that I want from the source, and then I'm going to pay particular attention to what I'm going to call d omega or del omega. This is the boundary 
of the you know, mask region. So in calculus, you often see this del omega is the del stands for boundary. Okay. And so the idea here is that um, you know, why would I not want to use this thing I showed you before all the time? Well, part of the problem is that there are going to be some distracting color mismatches. So if I apply this algorithm to, here's another composite example. So here's a scene of a beach, and here are some jet planes, right? And I can say, okay, here's where I want to take the jet planes. I want to put them into this region of the image. If I do that with the very same compositing technique I told you about last time, what I get is something like this. And here, there's a problem because the blue of the sky behind the jet planes is not the same color as the blue of the sky in the beach scene, right? So I kind of see that even though I've got this kind of fuzzy transition region here, there's clearly something where these, these planes have been pasted in, right? It looks like the background of the source is not the same as the background of the target, right? So that's, that's what we're going to talk about now is how I can mitigate that to make the planes still look like they're there, but that means I have to kind of change the colors of the image you know, more than I was before. So before I wasn't really trying to change the interior of the source at all. I was taking it and I would put it down and maybe try and gloss over the edges, right? But here that's not going to work just because of the differences on the you know, color of the source versus the color of the target. So what can I do? Well, the idea is that to reduce uh, color mismatch, between source and the target, the idea is going to be um, to kind of create the composite in what I would call the gradient domain. And so we know, right, that what we really care about when we look at an image in terms of, you know, if I wanted to composite those planes into the into the background, I don't really care that I've got exactly the same pixel colors of the planes as I did originally. What I care about is that, you know, in some sense, I want the edges from the source to be put into the target so that they look realistic. So kind of what I want to say is um, we want the um, gradient of the composite inside this transition region to look as close as possible to the source image gradients. That's one consideration. Also, the composite must match the uh, target image on the boundary of the region. So mathematically, kind of what I'm saying is I want to minimize for all of the pixels of the composite inside the compositing region, the difference, and here I'm going to imagine that things are kind of continuous, so I'm going to use an integral here. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to integrate over that area the difference between the gradient of my composite, which is what I'm generating, and the gradient of the source. I want to make that as small as possible subject to the constraint that the image that I create has to agree with the target colors right around the boundary of the region. Okay. And so for those of you that took differential equations, and I'm not sure if there's a follow-on course here, but basically the idea is that this is starting to look something like, for example, a heat equation, right? So probably when you were taking Diffie-Q long ago, you solved problems that were kind of like boundary problems, where you'd say, okay, I've got a bar that has got, you know, 
known temperature around its boundary. What is the temperature inside the middle of the bar, right? Or I fix something at one end. These kinds of problems come up in PDEs and DiffEQ all the time. And this is exactly the same kind of problem, right? Where I'm specifying a constraint on the boundary, and then I'm trying to see how things diffuse inside the boundary, right? So this is kind of like a heat equation or a diffusion equation. So for those of you that are more kind of like physics-y minded, this has a lot of connections to that, right? So um, in fact, the solution to this problem is given by the following. So I'm not going to derive why this is true, but the solution to this problem is very simple. It says that to solve this problem, I need to make the Laplacian of the composite equal to the Laplacian of the source inside this region. And I need to make the composite equal to the target on the outside of the region. And so this is basically a uh, Poisson equation. Right, so if you, um, if you ever remember from DVQ, you may have seen Poisson equations. If the, if the right-hand side of this happened to be zero, that would be called a Laplace equation, right? So if you remember, that's kind of like, um, uh, I don't, I'm not a physics guy, so I'm trying to remember an example where you get a Laplace equation. I think you get Laplace equations from basically heat equations, right? So if you ever solve the heat equation with the right-hand side equal to zero, you probably did that some, somewhere back in differential equations. And so here all we're saying is that, you know, I want to make the Laplacian of my composite image the same as Laplacian of my source image, which I can compute. And I want to make the boundary condition agree with the target on these pixels around the boundary, right? And so this turns out to turn into a very nice linear system that I can very easily solve, right? So let's talk about that for a second. So I have to deal with two kinds of pixels, right? I have to deal with pixels that are inside the region, and I have to deal with pixels that are on the boundary. And so there are these two kinds of pixels, right? So for example, pixel A is, so say, say that the dark gray region is the boundary, right? So pixel A is fully inside my region, right? So at pixel A, I can compute the Laplacian of my source and make that equal to the Laplacian of my composite. Pixel B is, tangent to a couple pixels that are on the boundary of the target, right? So this is where I'm going to say I'm going to make sure that these two dark gray pixels come from the target, and then I'm going to compute the Laplacian of B kind of assuming that these guys are fixed. So let me be a little more explicit here. So solving the problem. So um, discretizing and solving the problem. So there are two cases, right? One is for a pixel P that's fully inside this region, I compute, I need to make this true, right? I need to make this Laplacian equal to this Laplacian. And this is kind of like pixel A. Well, what does that mean? So here, I know that my Laplacian can be approximated with this operator, right? Where I have minus four in the middle and ones around the edges, right? So that's just like saying, here I have a set of five pixels that I can use to approximate the Laplacian over here. And on the right-hand side, I have the corresponding Laplacian of the image that I know. Okay. So 
That means that I have basically, these are some unknown things I'm trying to solve for, but it's a linear system in those things. Right? So kind of where I'm going is I'm going to set up a big linear system where I've got a huge matrix here, and then I've got all of my unknown, you know, my unknown uh, intensities, right? Kind of what I'm going for is how do I set up this linear system, right? And so what I've shown is that this is kind of like one line of that linear system where I'm multiplying minus four times one pixel and I've got some plus ones times some other pixels and the rest of these guys are all zeros, right? And the right-hand side here is just a number that I get from computing the Laplacian of the source at a certain point, right? So basically what I'm doing is I'm building up the system and I want to have, you know, basically n equations in the n unknowns of the composite, right? And the nice thing is that this particular equation only has five non-zero elements, right? So basically, even though I could have thousands of pixels inside my composite that I have to solve for, here, this equation only involves five of them, five out of a thousand, right? So this is going to be what's called the sparse equation, or a sparse linear system, which is good because that means that it's easier to solve under the hood mathematically. I'm not going to talk about the solution process, but that's good. When you have lots of zeros in a linear system, it makes it easier to solve, okay? So this is the equation I get for, you know, a pixel that's fully inside the region. And then there's the other case where I have for a pixel uh, P that is um, not fully inside this kind of, or maybe I say whose neighborhood is not fully inside this. So it's kind of like saying, you know, here's my let's suppose that this is my uh, boundary here. So let's suppose I'm looking at this pixel here. That's like saying, well, if I wanted to compute the Laplacian at this pixel here, well, it would include a couple of these pixels from the original target that are known, right? So here, I would say that my Laplacian at this point, right, is going to look something like, um, well, so let's see. That's like saying that if this is my unknown value here, I already know that I want um, these pixels here to agree with the target. And so my Laplacian that I would compute here would be something like, again, minus four times this unknown value plus, um, well, this is going to be the same x, y plus one. So I'm going to look at this pixel is going to be i x y plus one. This pixel is going to be uh, x plus one y. But these pixels, I'm going to force to come from the target, right? Because I know that these have to agree with the target here. So now I'm going to say I have the target at this pixel. So this is like saying I have, or I guess this pixel. This is like saying I have the target at this value and the target at this value, right? So this is kind of saying, you know, uh, the target must agree with the composite on the boundary. And then that equals, you know, then on the right-hand side is the same, right? The right-hand side is still the same source Laplacian I had before. So I still have a, I still have a linear set of equations. The only difference is that now, here, I'm only really dealing with three unknowns. And then this stuff is also known because I know the source and the target. So kind of I move 
some stuff over to the additional part of the right hand side. Right? So this is another um, set of another um, equation in the unknowns i. And so after I do this, basically I have one big linear system, right? So I've got a big linear system that has mostly things that look like, you know, fours and minus ones and zeros. So this is a big, a big sparse matrix. Mostly, you know, mostly zero with some, you know, minus fours and some ones. And then I have my various, you know, composites that I need to figure out. And then I have some right hand side that depends on S's and T's, right? This is where I bring in all of my known pixels from the sources and the targets, right? And so this is actually not a very hard problem to solve. If I think about this like AX equals B, I can use MATLAB just to say A backslash B to get the answer. Um, like I said, it turns out that under the hood, you know, there may be very fast methods for doing this that are inside backslash. So backslash, if you tell it that this is a sparse matrix, it will do a different algorithm than it will if you say that A is some big dense matrix, okay? And so the result of that is an image that I can get, right? So how does this actually look? Well, I put this whole thing together in MATLAB. So um, so here, this is exactly the algorithm I just discussed. There's a little bit of bookkeeping to uh, you know, actually make this thing. So this A here, the critical A matrix that I just showed uh, from here is actually a known matrix in, you know, um, linear algebra. It's called the Laplacian matrix. So actually, if I have a set of pixels with neighborhood relationships, there's one MATLAB command called del square, D-E-L-S-Q, -E that will make that matrix of fours and minus ones and zeros for me automatically. I don't even have to worry about constructing it myself. And then here, you can see I'm using some morphological operations that we talked about to get the boundary of the image, right? So I've got kind of, I'm leveraging the stuff we talked about last time where I originally have a solid boundary and I kind of erode it by one pixel to get the pixels that are going to be on the boundary. And then I have my source and my target. And I'm taking, you know, so there's some junk here that you have to worry about. But basically, I build up this right-hand side that has to do with, you know, Laplacians and gradients of the source of the target, I solve for my uh, unknown intensities, I put those intensities back into my target, and then I'm done. So let me show you kind of the result of this in MATLAB. So um, here's kind of a goofy example. So my source, okay, my target is going to be this image, and my source is going to be uh, this image, and my mask is going to be one of these images, I don't know which one it is. Uh, I think it's going to be this image. Either I mask one or I mask two. So let's try. Oops, maybe it's a PNG. Okay. So let's look at these things. So my my target is going to be this picture of my hand. Okay. And the source is going to be this picture of my eye, okay, which I think came from, if I have the original image, the image is, uh, I guess I don't know if I have my original, 
non-filtered eye image here. Okay. So anyway, I want to put my eye onto my hand, and I'm going to use a mask that looks like uh, this, right? So hopefully this will line up. So one thing you have to be careful of is that your source and your target have to be lined up, right? So if I um, make sure that my source and my target are lined up. I don't know if this is the right mask, actually. Um, So it looks like what I did here is that I cropped out my eye just to not include my eyebrow and stuff like that, right? So my mask is a little bit smaller than my full eye, okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my Poisson image, and let me see how I wrote it. So I supplied the source, the mask, and a parameter I haven't told you about yet, which I'm not going to use. So let's see, I'm going to just say Poisson, source, target, mask. Oh, I think my mask has to be a binary image. OK. And the result is, hopefully, creepy hand, eye and hand image, right? And so. Um, Again, I think there's some, some quality loss here on the screen, but it looks, it looks pretty good in the sense that you don't really see a boundary between where the eye and the hand came in, right? So the colors inside the eye may not be exactly the same colors as the original image, but the color of the skin is blended across that you don't actually see a, a color difference, right? If I was to just kind of paste the eye on top of the hand, I think you would see this difference between the shades, right? So you, you two can try this at home. Um, can we compare the period? Uh, can we compare the computer with that? I think that I have a uh, blend function here. That's a good question. So I believe I have a Laplacian pyramid here in here too. So so I think this should probably work the same way. So M1 is going to be the source. M2 is going to be the target, I think. And what is this extra parameter, NL? Number of layers. OK, so let's suppose that I do, um, I'm not sure this is going to work because I didn't actually try this at home. So if I do this and I supply it with just one layer, I believe this is going to be the equivalent of hard compositing. So let's see that actually looks like anything. Uh, see, I should have prepared this at home because I'm not sure this is actually where things went wrong here. Yeah, I'm not sure that I can debug this for you on the fly, unfortunately. But it does look like I had the foresight to actually try to do this. Um, where could it have gone wrong? Oh, where did this mask come from? Yeah, I'm afraid that I don't know exactly how I wrote this function. So let's not dwell on this for the moment. If I have some time at the end of class, let me see if I can come back and figure out what went wrong here. Um, I don't see why this shouldn't have worked, unless the mask is supposed to be on the range between 0 and 255. That's the only thing I can imagine that could be different. So let's try that for one second. If that doesn't work, we'll move on here. <laughs> Something is happening there, but not maybe the right thing. Uh, yeah, okay, so let's not, let's not screw around this right now because I don't want to delay things, but I can come back to this in, in a second. One thing I wanted to say is that um, 
this generally works pretty well. And so if I apply this to my example I showed you before with the airplanes, right? So here, this is the result of the composite when I use the Poisson algorithm. And you can see that what's happened is that the seam now is not perceptible at all, right? Because the blue of the sky has influenced the blue that was inside the planes. And so even though the planes themselves may be a little bit lighter, so if you compare the planes to this image, you can see that you know I've kind of made the planes overall a little bit lighter, but the gradients of the planes are the same, as close to as possible, the same as they were before, right? So that's kind of the idea is that I'm trying less to preserve the actual colors and more to preserve the edge structure, which is really what your eye picks up on. There is one situation where things can go a little bit wrong, and that is, oh, here's my eye example again. So here's this, that is the original image, right? It's scary. All right, this is just the image I showed before. Um, so things can go a little bit different if I moved my <laughs> compositing region from the original place to somewhere that overlaps with some gradients in the original image, right? So if I did my very same algorithm here, what I would get when I composited would be something that looked a little bit worse, right? So here, what would happen is that the, the composite region, the, the mask region, includes some colors that are going to smudge into my composite, right? Because I'm saying that I want to continue the target region over here into the interior of the composite. And so what happens is that Again, I get the gradients of the planes looking good, but I also get this weird green explosion that I don't want, right? So there's something I can do to mitigate that, which is something along the lines of saying I can modify my equation to say, um, it's called a mixed gradient uh, compositing. Right, so the kind of the idea here is that what we were assuming was that inside the compositing region, I was forcing the Laplacian of the image to agree with the Laplacian of the source, okay? And so there's kind of an underlying implication here that this is what I get by taking the kind of double derivative of a real image, right? However, I can make this more general, and this is again kind of getting back to some vector calculus stuff. Instead, I could say that I want the Laplacian of this image to look like the divergence of some arbitrary vector field. Right? So, kind of one way to say this is that I have a partial derivative of this vector field in X plus a partial derivative of this vector field in y. So kind of the idea is that um, here, the difference is that the right-hand side need not, uh, need not arise from um, Well, a Laplacian of a real image. And so if you're like a vector calculus person, this is what's called basically a non-conservative vector field. So kind of what this means is that instead of assuming that the Laplacian of the image has to equal some actual thing that was derived from the original image. Instead, I can just kind of say, I want to make the Laplacian of this image correspond to the arbitrary divergence of some other vector field. The vector field that I get here doesn't actually have to come from the gradient of some real image. It could just be any gradients that I come up with. And in this particular example, what I could do is say, for example, to mitigate that problem I showed you before, I could say that I want the uh, vector field here to be equal to the gradient of the target if the gradient of the target at that pixel is bigger than the gradient of the source at that pixel, 
and the gradient of the source otherwise. So what this means is it says, if there are some really strong edges in the target, then that's what you should try to do inside the compositing region, right? Otherwise, if there are no strong edges in the target and there are strong edges in the source, then use those source gradients instead, right? And that's exactly the situation that I have in this case, right? Because here, the problem is that there are strong gradients in the target coming from this mountain and these clouds that I want to keep, right? So this is like saying to the compositing algorithm, don't take the stuff from the plane, take the stuff from inside this region here of the target. And then in, in the plane image, right, here it's okay for you to take these gradients because there's nothing happening in the target up here. The gradients of the target are very small here. And so if I do that, then I get an image like this, where kind of I'm preserving the target gradients and these clouds inside the compositing area, but in places where there's nothing shaking in the target and it's flat, I get back the source gradients, right? So this is a, you know, a better looking composite. It would be problematic if I were to kind of superimpose the planes right on top of the mountain, right? Then the algorithm would have to make a weird choice about, you know, do I take the plane or do I take the mountain in every pixel? It would probably look pretty messed up. So, so that's kind of cool. And so again, it's not hard to write this stuff up in MATLAB and implement it yourself. That's what I did, right? So uh, all you're doing is creating this linear system based on taking the Laplacians of a couple images. So that would be kind of a fun thing to fool around with if you want. Um, I think that's a good place for me to, to stop. I guess the last thing I could say is that, you know, the quality of the composite that you get depends a lot on how you draw this line, right? And so in some sense, that line is just like for me, I was just doing this kind of freehand, right? I was saying, okay, let me take this region roughly, right? In theory, I don't really probably personally care that much about the exact boundary of the masking region as long as the final composite looks good. And so um, there are algorithms that try to basically uh, choose a good boundary automatically. So the idea is to say, okay, you know, suppose that I were to manually have drawn this light line, right? That's roughly where I want to outline my mask. Now I could have an automatic algorithm that would say, okay, you know, maybe I can get the best looking composite by making a slightly different boundary. That's this del omega hat, right? And I just want to make sure that I don't draw that boundary too tight on the object, right? So I have to make sure that there's some kind of interior part that I never go beyond, right? So for example, I don't want my boundary to cut into my airplanes, right? I want to make sure that it's fully outside the airplanes. But beyond that, I don't really care kind of how much sky I include in this boundary around the planes, right? So that's an algorithm that's called drag and drop pasting. So the idea is that you, you loosely draw the boundary, you use some sort of object segmentation to get the interior part that you don't want to go beyond, and then you let an algorithm kind of optimize between those two inner and outer boundaries to find the best compositing region. So like I said, we would talk more about this in the visual effects class. This is just like kind of one section of that, of that lecture. Um, so let me just say, um, you know, can also uh, use an algorithm to automatically find a good boundary for compositing. Okay, so any questions or comments? All right, so I didn't really want to do too much MATLAB debugging on the fly, but let me, uh, if I figure out how to, how to do that composite with uh, my Laplacian blending thing, I'll post that on Piazza so you can see the comparison between hard compositing, soft compositing with the Laplacian and Poisson compositing, right? So you can kind of compare all three things. Okay, sounds good. So I will...